Okay, I'm gonna show you an amazing portrait of me. Are you ready? Can you not, do you not see the likeness? My niece, who's now in her mid-twenties, gave me this when she was five. She said, you're the queen. Why am I showing you this? Because didn't we all do pictures like this? How do you like the ermine on the bottom? I think that, actually, did you get the ermine on the bottom? Okay, it's cotton balls, but when you're in kindergarten, SK, that's how you make it special. And I don't need to tell you what this beautiful uh, work of art represents, the glass slipper. I don't, I don't think I've met a little girl who hasn't, I don't know about the boys, but certainly the girls who uh, are captivated by fairy tales. I believe we're born with a sense that, that our life is meant to be about something nobler and higher than we usually end up with. Doesn't mean that that isn't a valid desire and our guest knows all about it. Deborah Evans here from Nashville. Home was Boston, and you'll pick up the Boston in just a moment. Uh, Deborah, I think maybe fairy tales helped you survive childhood. Absolutely. Would that be Ma. a fair statement? Absolutely. You grew up in the projects, but before that, even your conception was anything but a fairy tale. Do you want to tell us? Is it appropriate? <laughs> My story would actually be rated X, <laughs> yep. but for God. But for God, <coughs> this but is for a God. perfect title. There's the little princess dreaming of better things on the cover. Yes, mom was 15 and a half when she got pregnant at the drive-in theater with dad. And then dad was 21. Dad was 21, and they got married shortly thereafter. And that lasted about a year. And then they divorced. And then we went home and we lived with my grandmother in the projects of Boston. And at that point, uh, in the very beginning, I experienced the abandonment and the rejection and the fear and the insecurity uh, that you face in a situation like that. And sometimes people's dads don't physically leave, but they're emotionally checked out or moms, vice versa. And so it leaves you with a lot of baggage, but for God. <laughs> mm -hmm. You did a lot of pretending in those days. Yes. Um, it was Warden June Cleaver. I think we're your Absolutely. imaginary family. Boy, we hear that a lot. It will tell folks that we're in the same space, time. They were a hit on TV at that time. Um, but when your mom left home, what was she doing for work? My mom became an exotic dancer, and we stayed. She gave me to my grandmother in the projects, and she, and she lived there as well, but Nana was my, my provider. She was my yeah. caregiver. And uh, that was very difficult. Mother would not be there after school, and then she would come home 2, 3 in the morning, and. I would lie awake in bed at night, worried if she was going to come home, mm -hmm. and then have to get up, of course, the next morning for school, but filled with that fear and that dread of, am I going to have another loss? Mm -hmm. What else is going to happen to me? Am I ever going to be safe? And those were the feelings that I was left with. Nana sounds like a warm fuzzy, but some of the stories are shocking. Tell us about the milk, not drinking your milk. Well, Nana grew up in an abusive family life, and I hated milk like most, some little kids, not most, but some little kids. And so she would say to me, Deborah, if you don't drink this milk, you're going to wear it. And I would just sit there and cry, and she'd strip me down and stand me up on top of the kitchen table and pour that milk over my head. And I would just cry and I would think to myself, somebody come and rescue and me. rescue me. Somebody come and rescue me. And I, I think as women in certain situations, we think somebody come and just rescue me. Mm -hmm. And so I would drown myself in my little storybooks, but they kept me at that moment. They kept me in those, in those moments. Another thing I would do too is, is dress up. 
I went to parochial school. And I would dress up like a nun and put the rosary beads around my waist and teach my little invisible students in the bedroom, in the back bedroom. And, uh, and that was my way of escape. Yeah. I would just teach. And I did that for as long as I can remember up until I was about 11 or 12 years old. That solace, that, that place of peace was also, you say now, an early indication of God's calling on your life, teaching. Absolutely. You know, God puts the desires, gives us the desires of our heart. And even at that young age, teaching those imaginary students, those little stuffed animals, my parakeet, I loved to get in that back bedroom every day after school and teach. And what God does is the things that we love the most, the things that we're good at, everyone has a gift, everyone. God gives everyone a gift. That thing that you're good at, that you love to do, well, that's God's gift to us. And even when we don't realize, I mean, here I was five years old, grew, I was being raised a Catholic, and God's hand was on my life, even though I didn't know it. People sometimes don't realize he knows every one of us by our name, every one of us. And he has something special for every one of us. The Bible says he made us for himself. Absolutely. For his pleasure. Absolutely. Even if no one around you is seeming too pleased. Absolutely. The amazing thing is, even as a little child, you say you believed in God and you believed that he answered prayer and you felt safe in church. Yes, I did. There was a particular church in Boston that I would ask my Nana to take me to. And it was the Mission Church, Mission Hill Church. And we would go there. And I come to find out when I was teaching in New England a couple of years back, they told me that they had healing services there. There was, mm -hmm. a, there was an actual Catholic priest that had healing services. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I would kneel at the altar. And one particular day I knelt and and was saying a prayer, putting in my little dime. And uh, kneeling there, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. How old were you? Five years old. And I didn't know that at the time. And I heard that voice say, I am the God that healeth thee. And I knew God healed. And then I heard in my heart, and I'll use you one day. And I kept that. Oh, you must you know, have held that. You know, it says Mary pondered oh, those things. Yes. I kept that hidden in my heart. And I knew from that moment forward. And if we look over our lives, we can see the handprint of God drawing all of us. Sometimes we don't see it, though, Deborah, until we fully come into his embrace, until we become his child. And then we see with new eyes, he was there all the time drawing us mm -hmm. with loving kindness, with cords of loving kindness. Uh, it's, I, I don't know if I've read a book that is such a litany of horrible things. Uh, and you obviously have brought a mature pers perspective to the incidents and the emotions that you went through because it's so insightful. It's a, it really helps us understand what too many children are both experiencing and processing, you know, the outcome uh, of these. At age nine, you made a declaration of independence. And I think you, well, let me illustrate it this way. I had a, years ago, had, had a man come in to, to look at the plants that my husband had had from before we were married. And that was my job to keep them alive. I wasn't doing a very good job. And so I had someone come in who knew about plants, and he looked at this one plant that had a lot of greenery happening. He said, this plant has learned to air feed. In other words, it has been so deprived of nutrition and water that it has adapted. It has figured out how to survive from the air. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but neither does the path you, you took. Uh, you quit experiencing the hunger for love. You decided in order to survive, I have to live without what I'm not going to get. Explain from a nine-year-old perspective what that is like. 
you go into control mode. You're going to control everything around you as much as you can to stop from hurting any longer. You just shut down. You isolate and you separate. Surely you build up defensive walls. Absolutely. Layers so that nothing gets through. You let no one close. You can't trust. You don't know the next hand that might hurt you. And you completely shut down. You say you married a man you know you shouldn't have married. When you've grown up in abuse, that's all you know. And it carries on. And so you don't have an expectancy. What hits you is the insecurity. And my mother would say, you have to find someone to take care of you. And so you think to yourself, you're not worthy. Your self-esteem has been eroded. You've been shame-based. You live with shame. Mm -hmm. So someone wants you. And you know, I knew in my heart of hearts, I was saved. Now, I was only saved a short time, but I was saved. And this man told me he was saved. I didn't understand that I was even being lied to. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I shouldn't do it, but yet the fear and the insecurity of being alone forever mm -hmm. was hitting me. And so you believed you were going into a Christ-centered marriage as two believers? I believed that. I was saved for a short time. He said he was saved. And I went into the classic enabler. Mm -hmm. I was a classic enabler. And so I just thought he read the Bible with, I read the Bible and we went to church. And so, and, at, and then after, you know, eight months later after I marry him, I come to find out he's cursing God. But you stay because your whole past plays out. I grew up without a father. I don't want to have children without a father. Divorce is not of God. Now you're in the church. Divorce is not of God. And, and God does hate divorce, but God doesn't hate us. God hates what divorce does. And so I was in an abusive situation for many, many years. That marriage would end. You would raise two, two boys? Two beautiful boys, yes. And ultimately have a, a whole new story. Who's your husband today? Uh, <laughs> God gave me a second chance. My husband's name is Rick. And he is the lead singer and runs the group, the Imperials, the classic Imperials, who have just gotten back together. He's a wonderful man of God. He worked with Dr. Billy Graham in that ministry for 14 years. Promise Keepers, Greg Laurie. And uh, Rick loves God and he loves me. And, and together you have a marvelous ministry, <laughs> uh, Living Faith, a multifaceted ministry. Radio, Living in Faith. TV, Internet. Yes, Rick is a counselor, a Christian counselor. I thought, God, why couldn't you send this man a long time ago? <laughs> <laughs> now here's the thing, and I, I just think this is an important statement that you made. Family origins in dysfunction, turmoil, and chaos would be your emotional death sentence but for God. How did you break the pattern? How did you climb out of the learned dysfunction and clear the deck for new life in Christ? The book of Hebrews says that the word is alive, that it's life-giving and life-changing, and that it divides soul and spirit. As I let the Word, as I read the Word of God, the Word of God read me. A mirror. <laughs> and it begun to heal me. And I would be honest with God and say, God, I don't understand this. Please break through. And He would break through by reading that Word. Now, confession was part of it too. I, you talked about acknowledging things. We have to acknowledge um, where we are. Agree with God and be at peace. Um, and, and forgiving yourself was a big part. Firstborns, you're the only born. Uh, you blame yourself for everything. Uh, the, your mother having to be an exotic dancer, the family breakup. It's a crazy thing. Psychologists can explain it. Um, I'm sure the father of lies is all over it. 
the accuser, and you had to break free of all of that, a lifetime of it. The guilt, people telling you all the time, mother would say, I dance because of you. The marriage didn't work because of you. And so it's the light of God's word that has to break that off of your life. And the truth is, it's like the wind, when the wind blows. You can't see the wind blowing, mm -hmm. but you can see the after effects. When you read God's Word, God's Word sweeps over your life, and you do become that new creation. And old things do pass away. And we change from glory to glory, from grace to grace, from strength to strength. All things pass away. It says in Isaiah, it says, Behold, I do a new thing in your midst. And so as I surrendered the newness of Christ, the new life, the things that were dead from, from being empty and desolate to being filled, from being unstable to being stable. He gives you a name change like Abraham. Before Abraham was Abraham, he was Abram. Mm -hmm. And then he became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Oh, yeah. there was a, there's a name change that goes on. And so wholeness and healing. It's quite a book, it's very, very insightful. Through broken window panes, through those broken window panes, you dreamed of someone who would come and rescue you. You dreamed of a fairy tale. Are you living it today? I am living the dream. I am living God's dream in my life. I, the only one that's ever gonna ride up on that white horse is Jesus Christ. Well, I'm going to quote you from the book. If the life you are living is all you've ever known, it's hard to believe that something better might be coming your way. Well, I purchased this card. I think it's very special. It says, once in a while, right in the middle of our ordinary life, love gives us a fairy tale. Now, I would capitalize that word love. He has a name. He's the altogether lovely one. Jesus assures us, each of us, that if we look to him, I am the father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. I set the lonely in families. I lead forth the prisoners with singing. You will forget the shame of your youth. These are all promises. Prince Charming has come to rescue you, and he's waiting to meet you right where you are. We would be happy to introduce you personally. Our prayer partners are waiting for your call. The number is at the bottom of your screen. Don't give up on your love of fairy tales. God is waiting to write yours. And this book, But For God, may be the encouragement you need right now. Available where, Deborah? Butforgod.com. There we go. Thank you. Thank you for your courage, for your vulnerability, and for being here today. Thank you for having me.